following is a special CPTV 25th anniversary presentation. Matthew had uh, an actual infection from the ear. He's had years and years of infections, but this time it was a particular bacteria that literally ate a hole through his skull. And when we brought him here, his brain was actually herniating, was protruding into his outer ear canal. Um, when they opened him up, they found a hole through the skull. They found a fistula, which is like a channel going from his outer ear to his brain. And the covering of the brain was pitted, and he was actually leaking uh, cerebral spinal fluid from his ear. You know, we needed it. We needed, we needed something, and we got it here. We didn't have to go any further. She was um, one pound, five ounces. She's 12 inches long when she was born. And right now, she's four and a half pounds, and she's 17 inches long. Huh. Yeah. Stick your tongue straight out for me. Great. Okay. Now, should you feel any difference now? Yeah, it should feel a lot more free at this point. Does it yeah, feel a little more mobility? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to tell you now, so okay. that's not going to move around too much. Okay, so now post-operative instructions important again as far as uh, if you see any kind of oozing, just put a gauze in there and bite down. You can rinse, brush your teeth, and eat whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You may feel a little sore like you burn your mouth on some hot pizza or something. It's very painful. Mm -hmm. Also, we do have a couple of stitches in there, so we'll have you come back in about a week and have those on too. Okay. 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 Great. You did fine. Great. Oh, they're both the same. Yeah. Okay. I went right down. Both of this one's not as bad, but yeah. Okay, how did this happen? Pardon? How did this happen? I just got up to walk across the floor and my knees gave up. I was like this. Did you trip on anything? I probably did, but it happened so fast that it surprised me, so I went <gasps> flying. You didn't feel dizzy or anything no, before no. you fell down? No. You didn't feel no. any funny beats in your heart? No, nothing, no. Can I say, sorry, Mr. Sardelli, I'm on my way home. It's 4.30. No, you can't. So your personal life is not the same as other people's, I'm sorry. But it's very rewarding. I think it's the greatest thing that you know, a person can really do. I'm glad that all of you decided to go into medicine and dentistry instead of uh, into engineering and business and things like that that pay twice as much money. <laughs> People thought the health center was a place where people do research, or that the Yukon was somewhere in Alaska. Uh, people didn't know A, there was a hospital here, or B, there was a medical school, or C, there was a dental school, whatever. Riding back on a bus from New York City, two women as we came down 84, looked up, saw the health center, and, and one said, what is that big building? And the other said, oh, that's the University of Connecticut Health Center. It's a hospital, big hospital with very few beds. And I started talking to them, and I asked them, I said, are you aware that that is a medical school and a dental school as well as a hospital? I said, did you know that there are over a thousand students of one type or another going to school there? I asked them, did they know that it was generating over 25 to 30 million dollars of research funds for the state of Connecticut? Anytime uh, your son or our daughters would say, I want to be a doctor, we had to send them to other states. And it was costly. And uh, even beginning with Ray Baldwin, many people said, Governor Baldwin said, uh, why don't we create our own school? And I was convinced in the legislature when looking at uh, some of the youngsters from over east uh, where, I, where I came after moving to this country would come to me for help, how to send them to other states away from their families. The state schools give a priority to state residents. Okay, so if a youngster grew up in Connecticut, Yes, he, he had a chance to get into medical schools everywhere, including Yale, but Yale was, is a, school, a national 
heritage and therefore could only take a limited number of people from Connecticut. So the access in a state with a superb public education and private education system for students to medical school was a bit restricted. The uh, beginnings of the health center uh, go back really until into the 1940s when a Dr. Creighton Barker uh, from the State Medical Society, who was also a trustee of the University of Connecticut, uh, suggested that Connecticut needed a second medical school. That idea was taken up and uh, studied by a variety of uh, commissions and so forth, and uh, notably by uh, Mr. Alexander Keller of West Hartford, who became very enthused about the idea and uh, felt that a state school should be started for medicine open to anyone of talent, regardless of ethnic background or any other considerations. My father's part of that was to recognize that uh, as black people had scant opportunities for a medical education in a state where there was no public medical education, there was just Yale here. Uh, his own background, the Jewish background, uh, and people who came from Jewish backgrounds also were not being given opportunities and there were many Jewish candidates for medical school all, all of whom had to leave the state. Uh, my mother's involvement with the the development of the medical dental school and the health ultimately the health center uh, came subsequent to my father's death. She in effect picked up the responsibility. When she cared about getting something done you might not be aware of the amount of energy that she was uh, exerting to see that it happened because she knew that, that if you did see it, you might be, uh, you, you might be frightened off. Uh, I think that many of the people who got into her spell on the, uh, the development of the, the, the medical dental school uh, just didn't know what was happening to them. Uh, she was a great threat, and with her pal Helen Loy, uh, it was probably impossible to to beat, beat them or to beat them back. So Carol and Helen came to see me and said, I'll never forget it. Thank God you're resurrecting it again. And I said, I am with some help. And I said, I'm going to appoint this bipartisan committee. And they said, we hope it's the best. And I said, I know I have two people already. And one looked at the other and I said, that's right. The first two names is going to be Carolyn Keller, Helen Loy. You've got to serve. My recollection is that there were, there were meetings at, the, at my house uh, out on Bloomfield Avenue uh, that were almost like cell meetings. You know, there was the, the, these cars would come in and people would be seated. Uh, they, they sometimes met in the cellar and sometimes met in the living room and they would, uh, hours would go by and they would plot their course and they would, uh, they would talk about how to make this concept both exciting and palatable politically uh, to then Governor Dempsey. Uh, it wasn't easy because th at the outset the political liability of such a venture because of the tremendous cost both of the development of it and the implementation was the kind of thing that would put any governor at risk. One leading Hartford newspaper said that I was going to propose the 30 million or the 40 million and when the bill came to my desk, and this is history, I have the newspaper, they said I would veto this as a political ploy to get reelected. That really got my Irish blood up, so I really went to work on it and called in the legislative leaders. The issue was before the 1961 General Assembly, and uh, there was a, a significant opposition to the idea, based primarily on cost, of a projected cost of the proposition. Um, and it dragged and dragged. We had many long meetings. We had many differences, uh, good differences. But somehow, as time went on, I think they understood that this was going to be my goal, that it was an investment. And so after talking to the chairman of the Democratic Party, the chairman of the Republican Party, Mr. Bailey and Mr. Penny, God bless them both, they gave me their word, and I could have gone to China and come back. And that word wouldn't be good. When the original legislation was passed in 1961, there were really two uh, points. One of them appropriated uh, $2 million to uh, begin the project. There would be more, of course, but this was an initial uh, step. The other was to establish a site commission, a commission to choose, recommend uh, to the state the site for the two schools. It was very competitive. 
Some of the hospitals wanted us to build near them for the various reasons. And the land became a, a real bone of contention. controversy was if you're building in school back in the 60s a lot of states were going through the same kind of thinking uh, do you build a medical school or do you use the existing facilities and maybe build a didactic teaching center and then use the existing hospitals here that created great controversy some people thought that it seemed logical that the medical school should be built next to Hartford Hospital others said no St. Francis and others said no Mount Sinai because that's in the north end and that's where there's a, an area that needs uh, needs health care capacity. The so-called religious wars uh, allegedly determined the location of the uh, of the health center out in Farmington as opposed to in Hartford. Um, Hartford Hospital uh, uh, originally proposed that the health center be located across the street with Hartford Hospital serving as the university hospital. St. Francis uh, and Mount Sinai each objected for their own reasons. Allegedly, uh, the health center uh, was looking at a site adjacent to Mount Sinai where they originally began and that was not acceptable to either St. Francis or Hartford. You know, we were doing fine in our little WASP hospital, Catholic hospital, Jewish hospital, whatever. Um, and who are these guys and who do they think they are coming in here at such a late date? In the end the decision was to parachute this medical school down nine miles, seven miles out of town. Um, in addition it had attached to a little hospital and clearly that was one of the things that probably wasn't needed most was another hospital. I'm sure there were lots of other issues that were totally unrelated to what the hospitals wanted, such as real estate issues. Was there enough real estate uh, to accomplish what needed to be accomplished? And given what currently goes on at the health center and the amount of real estate and parking and uh, facilities that are necessary, it turns out that the folks who made that decision were probably somewhat clairvoyant because I don't think any urban site could have really done justice to the uh, needs of the health center, except perhaps the one behind Mount Sinai, which would have required the invasion of Keeney Park, which is another political issue. From the very beginning, everyone knew that the community would be enriched by having a medical and dental school here. Everyone wanted one. Thing is, they wanted it in their own backyard. And there were territorial squabbles about where it should be located and various hospitals already existing in the community. And I like to think those squabbles became so non-productive that at one point the committee said, the heck with this, and they found a marvelous farming family out here and bought a farm site and put it out here. cost of the building was probably about $100 million in 1976 dollars and, and I always point out to people that that's a fairly good investment um, 
when you look to see what it's going to do to cost to redo the 9184 interchange, it was something like $400 million. It is our role to be a leader in health care and health care delivery in the state for all people of Connecticut. We do not feel that our position threatens the positions of any other hospital or health care entity in the state. Our role is to augment, to complement, and to supplement what they're doing. Well, our missions are really fourfold, and they've probably been this since, since the beginning. We have missions of teaching, research, patient care, and community service. In the teaching area, we are charged with offering the opportunity for young people from the state of Connecticut uh, to enroll in medical or dental school and to obtain a medical degree or a dental degree. We also, at another level of teaching, in close relationship with our, all of our affiliated hospitals, conduct a number of internships and residency programs for those individuals once they are physicians or dentists to get specialty training. You are here with people getting all different levels of education <coughs> in health and you have research, a hospital, there are people here coming for nursing, dental hygienist stuff right through the higher stages in the profession really getting their doctorate degrees, PhD candidates, pharmaco pharmacology is here, there are people doing all sorts of things that have to do with health. The fact that I can study medicine here sure allows me to get a great education but it also allows something else uh, the fact that uh, tuition here is so reasonable when I leave school I won't have a, a, a large debt uh, that I would incur going to probably any other medical school um, I won't as a result I feel like I'll be able to enter the, the field of medicine that I want to um, and I won't have these financial pressures to enter a field because it may be more lucrative as opposed to certain other fields um, I'll be able to enter a field that I want to do because it's what I enjoy doing and not because I feel financial pressure from the banks or whatnot, federal government. I was accepted at a private medical school in Boston which was going to cost me twenty thousand dollars a year just for tuition no living expenses and I decided to go to UConn because I felt it was comparable in the quality of the program, in addition, I could relax and study and do well without having to worry about where my next meal was coming from. Basically, we're an educational institution. And to say that, uh, I have to put some qualifiers in it because the body of students that we have here, which is made up of the bulk being the medical students, then the graduate medical education students, and finally the graduate students in biomolecular structure, uh, all are being prepared for a lifelong learning process. This is not a trade school. We've got to create an environment which is intellectual, uh, which is stimulating, and it's scholarly. So therefore, the ingredients to make the educational system perform properly, you have to have research, scholarship, you have to have a clinical operation here. You have to have clinical programs to support the clinical education of the students. Uh, you have to have outreach programs for demonstration purposes. Uh, you have to do a lot of different things. It's not a trade school. Well, this place was handicapped right from the beginning because it was too small in terms of the uh, size of the hospital and it was in the wrong location. Teaching hospitals need lots and lots of sick people so the medical students can learn what to do, so the interns and residents can learn what to do, so the uh, faculty members can do their research. A lot of clinical research involves hundreds, thousands of people. You know, this is a 200-bed hospital. This hospital doesn't get the everyday nuts and bolts stuff that a big city teaching hospital gets. The primary uh, reason for existence here is the schools. Uh, the university hospital here is because of the schools. Uh, the university hospital has to be able to provide patient care in a superb fashion, but provide the teaching environment necessary to carry out the mission of the school. It's very obvious that uh, if the schools were closed down tomorrow, the university hospital will probably close the day after. 
If the university hospital closed tomorrow, we would put the school in a lot of jeopardy, uh, but not necessarily close the schools. I don't think the size of the hospital, the smallness of the hospital, is a problem at all from the hospital perspective. People in Hartford and in Connecticut are very aware of some of the old history of this hospital and health center, aware that at one point there was an attempt to build it twice as big. We were supposed to have a 400 and some bed hospital here as the John Dempsey Hospital. We were supposed to have an L building, which is twice the size of what we have right now where the academic programs are. And thirdly, the Newington VA Hospital was supposed to relocate here in 1969 or 1970 to give us about a 750 bed complex. None of these things happened. That we have basically a 232 bed hospital has really altered our way of delivering our educational mission. We're an interesting hospital. Uh, because we came late and because we're so small, we're probably as genuine a tertiary hospital as it's possible to be. That is, we don't do very much that's ordinary. We do a lot of very specialized things, um, a sort of odd mix of specialized things that developed partly because of, of which services were needed in the Hartford area and in Connecticut as a whole. It's always hard to know with an institution how, exactly how it got the way it is. I think it's clear that there's been a a worry about competing too much with the other Hartford area hospitals and that some of the services that we've developed such as the newborn intensive care have been based very much on a mutual need. baby born in another hospital that's uh, needing intensive care or a level of care that's above that that nursery then we'll go out and get that baby and when we go we'll send a clinical specialist a staff nurse and a respiratory therapist if it's a baby with respiratory problems going down the hill just sliding down the hill working at John Dempsey Hospital is a little bit different than working one of the other community hospitals because we are the perinatal regional center we do a different level of care here and when we go out to another hospital and there's a baby that needs that level of care we have to begin that level of care out at the other hospital and we also then have to um, try to educate people in the other hospitals so that if you have a baby if you work in a smaller hospital that isn't an intensive care nursery you have a baby that has some um, severe respiratory distress and you're not used to taking care of those babies all the time we then have the responsibility to um, sort of increase people's skill and knowledge level so that when they have that baby there they know how to maintain that baby until we can get there or if it's a baby that's going to end up staying there the next time that we can to help them to increase their skills one of the things that makes that helps to make an obstetrical and neonatal service strong and safe for mothers is to have very well trained nurses one of the very exciting things that we've done is that we have a very strong clinical nurse specialist program these nurses have master's degrees are very sophisticated clinically. They know a lot more about their particular field, say, than I would know about that field. They are responsible um, for helping to establish nursing practice, for teaching other nurses, for teaching patients, uh, and for providing a whole lot of elements of direct patient care. Like I said, I had a normal, healthy pregnancy up until, you know, the, the day that I found out I was in labor. <laughs> but.
uh, Nicole's story was that she uh, was going to come very early because her mother had an incompetent cervix uh, and went into labor uh, and developed some infection. And so Nicole was delivered at about uh, 24 weeks. So that's about 16 weeks early. And she weighed one pound and five ounces. And she has. 60% of our patients was sent here in her mother still and uh, it happens that I was there at her delivery by cesarean section uh, and Nicole was intubated uh, and put on a respirator immediately within the first minutes after birth uh, and maintained for a period of several months on the respirator while she grew and developed uh, as she would have been doing in her mother's uterus uh, and is now a, a beautiful independent uh, active uh, intact baby. When she first started feeding, she was getting um, one cc, which is one-fifth of a teaspoon. <laughs> it's like a little itty bitty drop. And then they keep increasing it as she tolerated her food, her feeding too well. She didn't have any problems there. Got a belly like a dad too. <laughs> Both for the fifth year and the tenth year, we had reunions of the graduates of the nursery. Uh, the tenth year reunion was fantastic. We really had a tremendous turnout, and one of the most gratifying things was to see the babies who were doing well. It was a birthday party to mark an anniversary, but it was really much more than that. It was a party to celebrate life. The lives of some 3,500 children delivered at the Yukon Neonatal Intensive Care Unit since its creation in 1975. Today, those children are alive and healthy, thanks to research into caring for premature infants. Many years ago, I won't mention exactly how many, uh, in the babies who are around two pounds, we used to lose 90, 95% of them. And of the 5% or so that survived, about 90 percent had significant neurologic residual. Now, uh, if you're born around two pounds, you have a 90 percent chance of survival. 750 children born here since the center opened were on hand for the birthday party. Among them were the Zipidelli quadruplets. The odds of uh, quadruplets coming out as healthy, happy babies are, are very low, but we attribute their healthiness to the hospital. For these kids and their parents, this center has made all the difference, and that's something they'll be happy to celebrate again and again. This specialty has developed nationally as a regionalized specialty. It isn't as if you're going to set up shop and compete for business and uh, try and outmarket anyone else. It's really a regional service program, and our program is fully integrated with uh, Hartford and uh, St. Francis, uh, uh, as well as Mount Sinai and the other hospitals in the area. The pediatrics programs in the greater Hartford area have become very well integrated together. There's a lot of cooperation between all the different hospitals uh, because we all have basically the same goal, which is what's best for the children in our community. Uh, we've recognized that it's a wasteful and expensive and counterproductive to try to recreate all the specialized services at every hospital. And we have agreed among ourselves to uh, develop areas of expertise and specialization at different centers. For instance, uh, at St. Francis, uh, there's been uh, a concentration on general pediatrics at Hartford Hospital. Uh, gastrointestinal problems, heart problems are, are being cared for in a very specialized area. At uh, Yukon Health Center, one of the main areas of interest has been uh, children's cancer and blood diseases. Well, we're from Coventry, and the reason we ended up here is uh, we noticed the, a lump growing in Tori's stomach, and we took him over to, uh, was it Wyndham? Wyndham Community. Oh, Wyndham Community in Willimantic. And this was uh, oh, about 10 o'clock at night or whatever, and Linda came back and said, well, they think he's got a tumor, so you've got to you know, take him over to UConn. Well, the Children's Cancer Program at the University of Connecticut Health Center began in 1974. Prior to that time, children with cancer had to go up to Boston or down to New York, travel considerable distances even for routine follow-up. 
uh, because there was no specific uh, specialized program in this area. Since that time, we have had referred to us over 200 children with leukemia and various types of solid tumors. Uh, those children are hospitalized on the inpatient unit, the pediatric floor at the John Dempsey Hospital. But most of them, uh, probably 98% of our patients at any given time, are not in the hospital. They're outpatients. Our goal is to keep them at home. Uh, they are followed in our pediatric day room, which was funded by uh, the support of the Hartford Whalers and is known as the Hartford Whalers Day Room. I don't like to see families separated. I think everybody should be home together for dinner. Children should sleep in their own beds. Mothers and fathers should be at home at night with their children, and if their child is in the hospital, you can't do that. So at any given time, our inpatient census may be anywhere from two to 12 patients, but that for everyone in the hospital, there are probably 40 or 50 who are out of the hospital. The months of uh, chemo and then some more surgery, and I find that good feeling when they get the tumor out. Uh, there's kind of a nice feeling up on the whole floor when that happened. Yeah, we got uh, just a lot of excitement. In fact, one of the nurses just about jumped over the, uh, uh, the railing just to come running to tell us that uh, they had it out. And then, now just the, uh, the months that have, that have gone on since there are more chemo and the midnight runs in. And he, he's attached to them and we know that when we bring Tori in that they'll be here and they'll take care of him and he goes to them and all his needs are taken care of. I think we try to be a very special part really of every hospital in the state by providing them services which are too specialized really to have in a small community hospital or even a large community hospital and yet we try not to take away the kind of community-based care which is so important to everyone really we because of the size of our center in terms of the smallness of our hospital our need to interact and want to interact with our affiliated hospitals and haven't been able to make ourselves just into an isolated ivory tower uh, and we work closely with all of the affiliated hospitals in the community that jointly run programs and to, to have the, the dollar that they spend on health care and health professions education and the dollar we spend hopefully generally add up to three dollars for the community. Family medicine is a unique uh, situation. The chairman of that department, Dr. David Schmidt, is chairman of the university program in family medicine, but also he is director of family medicine at St. Francis Hospital and Medical Center. Further, it's, it's unique in the respect that his clinical site is at the hospital so that it's not at the university. His major effort is here at the hospital. The practice site is away from the hospital by a few blocks. It's a program, outpatient program, that's sponsored by both institutions but funded by the university. Essentially, the cost of the program is shared by the two institutions. Uh, it's one of those uh, rare win-win situations where the cost of the department and its programs to the medical school is decreased and the hospital obtains a whole program for half the cost of a full program. So that here you have a, a blending of resources and assets into a single program that forms the program for each institution. Well, the Asylum Hill Family Practice Center, as it's now known, it has two major purposes in mind. One is obviously to provide patient care for the residents of the area, as well as anyone else who would like to come to us. We have no geographic boundaries. It's really much more a question of uh, can people, is it convenient for people to, to find your place and come to you? So there's, there's that patient care um, goal. And the the training that goes on for the family medicine residents and the medical students who rotate here. A good many of the uh, people and families who live in this neighborhood are low and moderate income and many of them are on different kinds of public assistance, welfare, city assistance and other forms of uh, aid. 
uh, they cannot afford to go to a personal doctor the way most people would. They don't have insurance to pay their benefits. And many doctors in the neighborhood won't take their uh, insurance for full payment. That's what they call assignment. With family medicine, they get a much better deal than they would at what you would consider to be a clinic. It's run like a regular doctor's office. They're assigned a particular doctor, they have an appointment, and they see their own doctor. With family medicine, the doctor deals with them and their whole family as a unit. We're in a very enviable position and we do not have to turn people away because they have no means to pay for their care. Uh, bottom line, we're collecting perhaps 42% on the dollar. Now, a, a private practitioner in his office could not take this kind of a loss. Now, at the same time, uh, we're trying to meet the needs of all people. And we just recently uh, extended our office hours two nights a week, hoping to catch some of the working people who come down here to work in the day, hoping to catch some of them on the way home. For instance, the, the mother who comes home late in the day and finds that the child has a high temp, or perhaps the uh, Aetna employee who comes down here to work and uh, can stop by the office uh, to have his blood pressure checked on the way home. I think what we're trying to do is offer the same level and the same quality of care to any one of those patients regardless of who they are where they came from and we're trying to not make any distinction as to whether they've got three credit cards in their pocket or a blue and white state card that says they're on medical assistance we work with the asylum hill organizing project a lot which is a community activist group we have projects with the neighborhood churches and um, thus the daycare center has evolved from work with grace lutheran church and asylum hill organizing project um, and the y and so we've been involved in community activities and in and just being here uh, open door never turning away uh, any patients we have some responsibility for interfacing with the community in a number of areas for example we run the connecticut poison control center which answers 20 30 thousand phone calls a year from people throughout the state round the clock to when there's accidental poisonings in the home or in the workplace um, we provide education to and training as paramedics and first aid training and cardiopulmonary resuscitation training to a number of the of lay individuals as well as to most of the police forces and ambulance corps in the, in the area. These are just some examples of what we do in the area of community service. Connecticut Poison Control Center. Okay, what's the name of the medication? Okay, and what is it called? All right, and how old is your son? The Connecticut Poison Control Center here at the University of Connecticut Health Center is the state's comprehensive resource for poison control and poison prevention. We offer the 24-hour-a-day poison hotline to all 3 million residents of the state. We study the incidence of poisoning reported to us by telephone, and we do limited amounts of education in the area of poison prevention. In 1987, the hotline will have handled about 30,000 calls. Uh, that's an average of 90 calls per day. There's two situations. One is um, a call or a situation that you've had 100 times before over the phone. Um, a child eats a small bite of a bar of soap. That's something that I've had 100 times. And I know right off the bat that that's not going to be a problem. So I can tell the mother, oh, I don't think this is going to be a problem. Let me check my information. So I can do reassurance almost immediately. The other situation is where you have a product that, or a drug that you are not familiar with, and you need to check information uh, before you recommend a, a treatment. And those are a little bit more difficult because you're going to have to tell the mother, I'm going to check. And, and it may take a, you know, a couple of minutes before you can actually give a specific advice. And those are a little more uh, upsetting to both the caller and, and to the person taking the call. Those are more uh, emotional. <laughs> we have to work by phone. We're not there to use our hands to uh, examine or observe the patient. And so an important element of that is calming the person down at the other end of the telephone. That's correct. And what will happen is he's going to vomit three or four times. All that medication will come out and he'll be fine. And what I'm going to do is call you back in about a half hour to see how things are going and to give you some further instructions. And you've already given me your phone number. So um, you'll be hearing from me in about a half hour. 
And if you have problems along the way, call me right back. Okay? Very, very good. I'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Many citizens of the state don't realize that while we have a very large budget, and this year it'll approximate 210 to 220 million, but only a very small percentage of that, around 25 to 27 percent of it, will come from the state of Connecticut. Um, there probably aren't too many other agencies of the state that have to generate so much of their keep not from the state taxpayers' dollars. We're willing to go out and to generate the three quarters of our budget that we need to, not from the state. Um, do it through patient care revenues. We do it through, I'm proud to say, highly successful competition uh, at the national level for research grants and contracts. Our, our dental school, out of 59 dental schools in the country, is, I think in 1986, was number one in the country with getting new grants from the National Institutes of Dental Research. In comparison to, to other schools of dental medicine, uh, if you take, for example, the number of individual R01s, which are individual research awards, uh, we'll have a higher number than usually anybody in the country in any given year. Dollar-wise, we'll rank in the first three uh, in terms of individual research awards. So the, the level of activity uh, is, is certainly well above average, and in part a reflection of the kind of faculty that has been recruited to this institution over the years in that uh, the overwhelming majority have, in addition to a dental degree, specialty training and a graduate degree. Our medical school, with among all the medical schools started in this country, there have been about 35 or to 40 that have been started since the 1960s. Our medical school is one of the top two or three with getting those grants. One of the things that the health center does that your local community hospital does not, and I think it offers a, an edge for us, is research. Um, not only are we disseminating knowledge, but our professors are constantly in their labs creating knowledge. Research is not an abstraction. It's not a bunch of laboratories with people working on hard to understand principles or with machines, the purpose of which are not clear. It is rather an incubator to take an idea that has later relevance to patients and to illness and to bring that idea to a point where it can be transferred from the laboratory to the clinical setting. That's the difference between a graduate school and a medical center. The discipline that is used in doing medical research, uh, clinical medical research, uh, spills over into the care of patients. For the most part, if, uh, if one has an illness that's reasonably straightforward and easy to care for, uh, it's not critical whether it's cared for in, in, uh, in a small hospital, in a large hospital, and, and uh, it doesn't require the resources of an academic health center. I think, however, in the cases where there are any questions about the illness involved or the treatment involved, that, that an academic health center, the clinical discipline that can be brought by an academic health center is something that's different from what can be brought in other clinical types of institutions. Let me give you an example by way of one of the disciplines as representative of many of the uh, disciplines in medicine. A lot of our work began in cardiology, looking at cardiovascular drugs. The example is a very simple one. Let us suppose that a patient comes to one of the clinicians upstairs and is admitted to the hospital. He's diagnosed, he's put on some kind of uh, uh, therapeutic regime basically to correct his abnormality if, if he can do so by, instead of like, via surgery. But then the question becomes, are we using the right medications to correct a particular abnormality like a, like a cardiac arrhythmia, for example? Uh, this is where you begin to migrate out of the hospital bed environment and begin to rely on the other disciplines here in the health center. At one level, you have the clinical research efforts, which are conducted in laboratories on the floors upstairs, mm -hmm. primarily via uh, human studies as well as animal studies. At that point, you begin to migrate slowly down here when you want to understand the molecular basis for how one of those medicines work, or actually how they don't work. Once we have an idea of what the molecular structure of a drug molecule is, in this case, the drug molecule has not been incorporate into any cellular membrane. 
we can get details about the shape and from here we can then compare this to what the structure of the drug molecule is when it is actually embedded in a biological membrane. It often turns out that a particular medicine is prescribed by trial and error and what we are trying to do is remove that trial and error process and define specifically the components of a medicine that will make it particularly targeted to that disease or that particular disease state. The Biomolecular Structure Center is just one way in which we are beginning to develop partnerships with the corporate world and the research that is going on there can be easily taken or transferred to corporations and businesses, pharmaceutical companies. They see a potential payoff in terms of developing new medicines. Things that they would normally have done in the past that may have taken years of trial and error, I think the pharmaceutical industry is seeing here an opportunity to do that a little quicker, but to do it on a more rational and sound basis. Most of the discoveries that come out of uh, basic research laboratories are very early stage. Frequently the potential value, and I should say often the potential uh, value of these discoveries is not clear. It's not clear to me, it's not clear to anyone. It's very important as we select a path for moving this technology from the laboratory out into the marketplace that we have the close cooperation of the faculty member who discovered it. In order to secure uh, that, that cooperation and that involvement, they must benefit from the process. The University of Connecticut Research and Development Corporation is something that was established by the University's Board of Trustees and by the, by the Board of the University of Connecticut Foundation. The genesis of the idea came from the Health Center and it's really a, a vehicle that allows us to take the results and the expertise of our research faculty here and translate it in their findings and translate them more quickly to applications in the community. The Research and Development Corporation is not in business to to build up a large retained earnings for itself. It's essentially to to meet our expenses of conducting this activity and to flow our profits back to the university to fund more uh, basic research and thereby complete the cycle of basic research, uh, innovation, commercialization, profit flowing back to the university to fund more basic research. In this institution, I think we're particularly blessed by having a large number of people who wear two hats. They are successful scientists, and at the same time, uh, they are active and effective physicians. In this laboratory, for example, that I'm sitting in at the moment, we do a variety of things directed at one level to the therapies of liver cancer, which affects a great number of patients and how to deliver medicines to the liver that protect the normal cells but injure and destroy the tumor cells. At the same time, things become very practical where one of the other physicians in the group has invented a device that can deliver a solvent, a solution to the gallbladder and dissolve without surgery gallstones. Those ideas started in a test tube Institutions such as ours need the, the university to provide an academic ambience and support system that is extremely important in running quality programs and developing that spirit of inquiry that is so important in developing training programs. And as an example of some of the things that flow from that kind of relationship, medical students come to the institution and that does enormous amounts to stimulate the uh, the spirit of inquiry among staff members and to keep them on their toes and have them excel more so than they would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. So he had been on much greater doses before? He had been on uh, 160 milligrams a day and 100 a day of Okay. And. The reason why this disease is so dangerous is because the skin breakdown leaves someone exposed to infection, um, or is it something else in probably, addition to that? Probably several reasons. Uh, one of the biggest problems is Pemphigus traditionally has almost 100% mortality rate. It's very high. I remembered that, and I wasn't sure why. I think that uh, there are several reasons. First of all, with the fact that we have medical students and, uh, at these various institutions in also increases the quality of patient care. Medical students are fairly naive. 
They're not very sophisticated. And they will ask the question, why are you doing that particular thing to the patient? People have to step back and know they have to know the answers. Same with the residents. A little more sophisticated. But they also ask questions. Why are you giving this patient penicillin now for the last 29 days? There must be a reason for it. There's no greater check in a balance than somebody looking over your shoulder and over their shoulder and their shoulder still and saying, did you do the right thing? Why did you do it? Do you know why you did it? What's the literature? What's the history? What's the track record? Why is it going to work? That's good for patient care. Everybody benefits from that. So I, I think we've helped the institution, and they've helped us in that because we're so small clinically, we have to depend upon them for the education of our medical students and our graduate medical education students. What the health center has that the other hospitals need desperately is the teaching that goes on, the accreditation. Part of the accreditation process of these hospitals is affiliations with universities. And up until UConn came, none of the hospitals in Hartford or in the Hartford area had academic affiliations. They had training programs that were accredited. And uh, I think that the hospitals have become increasingly concerned over the last couple of years, and with good reason, that they're going to lose that accreditation without some uh, academic affiliation. And lo and behold, here's UConn you know, uh, sitting out here saying, we've got it. We've always needed one another. I think that uh, the health center was designed to depend upon the community. The hospitals have uh, come around to a realization over the past two decades that the health center is increasingly important. And uh, I think more than any other reason we need the health center in order to elevate and continue and continue to elevate the level of medical science or healthcare science in general in this community. One of the challenges that, uh, as you're probably aware of, that faces uh, Dempsey Hospital and the health center in the future is the relationship with Hartford Hospital and Newington Children's Hospital. A uh, proposal has been made that Newington physically relocate to the campus of Hartford Hospital and that Hartford and Newington have a joint pediatric program. That then brings into question what is the role of the health center, which already has a number of children's programs. It is logical that the Newington Children's Hospital and Hartford Hospital would put such a, a, a thing together. It is inconceivable to me that it could reach its full maturity uh, without deep involvement with the university. The minimum involvement would be teaching programs and the research programs. The maximum involvement would be somehow that they were wished to, which they do not yet, to include themselves somehow in that process. And when I say that, I, that's not just something that they could say, hey, yeah, I guess we will. It is one heck of a complicated kind of thing to do. I think whatever has to be done in that area, the three facilities will have to be involved. Uh, as I said to the, the president of uh, Hartford Hospital and the president of Newington Children's Hospital, Whatever you do, you have to bring UConn into this program because they are a vital part of the health care for children in this area and they have to be involved in this whole discussion. I think one of the, the large problems facing the health center in the immediate future is how do you deal with the changing health care environment? That is, how reimbursement is taking place. For instance, John Dempsey Hospital sees a lot of very difficult patients. It's a small hospital. It can't spread the, the cost over a large patient uh, volume. So therefore, the costs are high. Um, if employers are now designing their benefit programs to encourage employees to go to low-cost hospitals, they've got to compete. And in order to compete, they have to play the game in the modern world of capitalism in healthcare, because the healthcare is going through a capitalist uh, evolution, if not revolution. That means that they can't continue, as most university centers are, to be very high-priced relative to the competition. Because as people join alternate delivery systems, they are going to stay within those systems rather than have to pay extra to go someplace else. That means they have to price compete. Well, because they're a state facility, everything they do is open to public scrutiny and review. Every spending program they undertake, every salary they pay is all, is all available for public uh, consumption. In addition to that whole public review, there is the problem with trying to get a capital project approved. 
you have to go through the University Health Center board, then you have to go to the University of Connecticut board, then you got to go through the Board of Higher Education, then you got to go through Office of Policy and Management to get in the governor's budget. If the legislature approves it, they have to go through the Department of Public Works where it has to go out to bid. While all this is going on, you also have to come before the Commission on Hospitals and Healthcare, like any other hospital, to get your capital project approved if it's something that, to determine if it's something that we believe there's, is necessary. All this can take a great deal of time, many times three, four, five years. By the time it goes out to bid and the bids are back, the price is greater than was authorized by the legislature and you have to go back and start over again and the public thinks you don't know what you're doing because every day you're reading the paper how the cost was greater than anticipated. If we have to generate a lot of our own income, we need the freedom and flexibility to compete with other sectors in healthcare in the state and to swim in the same rivers with them, to sink or swim in the same rivers with them. And we've had the ability through a number of legislative committees and through the concern of the legislature and their understanding and through the governor's office to conceive some flexibilities for us. Um, most recent example of which was the ability to create the John Dempsey Hospital Finance Corporation which allows us to, to let the university hospital be out from under some of the procedures of the state so that it can compete on a par with the other hospitals in the state as it seeks to fulfill its missions. And I've been very pleased with those accomplishments which have had virtually the unqualified support but serious questioning but but qualified support once we've shown the reasons why to the General Assembly and to the governor. I think on the whole the area and the state benefits when we do well. We provide many services that are at least partially subsidized and that couldn't be provided by a community hospital, by a freestanding hospital. Uh, when you're facing a dilemma as tremendous say as AIDS where part of the problem is that those people can't always pay for their care. It's important to have an institution that has enough state help. We don't have a lot, but we have some. Enough state help to, to keep going in the face of, of real patient need. Everybody, no matter if they work in a lab or work administratively, really is compelled by the reality of what takes place in the hospital or in the outpatient. You don't have to spend more than an hour in an emergency room in any hospital, much less a university center, and see the failures of the limits of what we know to want to do something better. And that's what medical centers do. They show you what you know, they pat you on the back because of your successes, but they remind you that there is more yet to do and they give you the tools with which to do it. My daughter who lives in Willington, when it, be, when it became time to go to the hospital, she was at the uh, Manchester Hospital, and uh, all of a sudden, t so many, many months early, she had to be rushed to the Dempsey Hospital. Her little baby weighed absolutely, it's unheard of. But that baby was kept alive, brought back to life. There isn't any question. I don't have to read that. Or I, I was there. I saw it. But, uh, you know, became eight pounds and a few more pounds, and every pound we just prayed for an ounce. And that little fellow is as healthy, thank God, as you and I are today. I, I'm convinced without this neonatal, he never would be alive. Never. So, you see, I got back $50 billion for anything I did for the hospital.